Welcome to Creative Living, where we help you live your most creative life. I'm Jane Manzuris. Okay, listen up, my craftastic friends. If you like to make jewelry, or pottery, or artwork, or whatever your passion is, today we're gonna give you tips on how to turn your hobby into a business. But first, let's take a look at what's coming up on the show. I have some fun ideas to make your 4th of July party a blast. We'll show you how to make a necklace out of buttons. And we'll check out the latest trend, tiny homes. That and so much more on this episode of Creative Living. Have you ever thought about turning your passion for crafting into a business? Well, whether you like photography or painting, cake decorating or sewing, more and more people today are looking to take their hobbies and make some money with it. So today I am with Jen Cushman, mixed media artist and entrepreneur. Now, Jen, I know that you actually had a day job and sort of took a leap of faith and went into selling your mixed media jewelry and also teaching. What would you say for somebody to get started making money with their hobby? Well, the first thing you have to do is make it. And then after that, you need to sell it. So best thing to do is get your friends and have a trunk show. Um, if you have some money and some capital, go do a um, you know one of the craft fairs or the shows. And you can also do an Etsy store. You can sell online. But the most important thing is to just get started. Yeah, a lot of people might be scared in just getting started. But again, I love that just get started, which can be one of the challenges that people face. Absolutely. I mean, it's scary to start a business and particularly when you have your handmade stuff because you don't know if it's going to if it's going to if people are going to like it, if you're going to be able to make money off of it, if it's going to, you know, will they will they appreciate the fact that I put this much time into it? Right. And so the first thing we need to do is get it out there be different than other people. Yes. And then really just get it out on the market if you have a lot of stuff to sell. Exactly. I mean, most people that actually consider doing a hobby have critical mass. They have a lot of stuff. That's how I started. I collected a lot of things. I had a lot of stuff. I had to start doing something with it. So that's just what led to making some money off of it. Yeah, and I love that. And you're very successful at it as well. So what are some of the best advice that you got that you would pass along to others? The best advice I got was to make sure that you work it out. You know your style, you know what you like, you know what's going to set you apart from others and what's going to make you different. You don't want to go to a craft fair and have your work like look like everybody else's because then it's just more challenging to bring in the dollars. But if you have your own unique style, your own unique presence about you, your own your story, those kind of things make it easier. I love that too. Own your own story. Mm -hmm. A little bio along with what you're making. Yeah. People don't just collect from the stuff, the piece, they like to collect the artist too. They like to know about you, they like to know why you did it, they want to know the inspiration behind it. So you also have to talk. You can't just sit there and make, you have to be engaging and tell people who you are and what you're about. Well, if it's your passion and you love it, you're gonna to wanna to talk about it and you're gonna make some money. Jen, thank you so much, you stay right there. Jen's coming back a little bit later in the show and she's gonna show us how to make a really cool DIY project. Blacksmiths are not as common as they used to be, so we're taking a field trip to meet a craftsman who's keeping his trade alive. My name is Peter Seven, and I am an artisan blacksmith. I produce hand-forged uh, ironwork of all kinds from small items like nails and belt buckles up to big gates and uh, I use traditional tools for the most part and uh, have a wide variety of work I've done. I got into the craft because I decided I wanted to do some work with my hands and I had a good friend uh, in New Mexico who had taken this up and became very interested in this. I found I was very fortunate in meeting an older man who helped me along quite a bit, kind of pointed the way for me, helped me start this shop. Most of my tools over the years I've made, uh, some of the major machines I use, my hammers, my tongs, all my punches and chisels I've made myself. The tool that you use the most in a blacksmith shop is the anvil. Uh, it's pretty much the center of the work. I like using my hand hammers more than anything. I, uh, to think, and most of them are 30 years old, so uh, to make something that 
far back and for it to be so uh, well made and the fact that I use it every day is really uh, one of the reasons why I got into this craft. Well, the things I create most regularly are fireplace screens, table bases, door hardware, gates, railings, uh, and very small items from nails up to belt buckles. A lot of my work comes from clients, and generally it starts out with an idea, something they want. I try to find out if they have any ideas about what they want. I'll do some very simple sketches for them, and generally that's just about all I need to do. They'll say yes or no, or I would like it to be more like this or more like that. And eventually we, we uh, decide how it's going to be done. I start and I lay it out full size generally. Right now I'm working on a door to a house, it's a glass door. I'll probably have more than 200 hours in it. I've done other jobs that were more than that, and I have some jobs that only take me a day or so to do. I get great satisfaction out of working with your hands. I think that's something anyone would uh, get satisfaction out of. And just generally working hard, you feel really good when you go home at the end of the day. I would say the best part of what I do is when I'm I'm coming down the home stretch and I finish the job. And a lot of times I'll look at it and I'm not too sure that I've done, done it right, but generally, maybe even years down the road, I'll look at it and think, boy, that turned out pretty good. We've got a lot more to come on Creative Living. We're channeling our inner cowgirl for a cool craft room crash and an easy party favor for your 4th of July party. Looking to add a little cowboy chic to your decor? Well, you're going to want to hitch your wagon to this craft room crash. This is Craft Room Crash, and I'm outside DIYer Brooke Rose's house. Now, she says she was born with a glue gun in her hand and loves the magic of the creative process. So, let's go crash her craft room and find out what magic Brooke is gluing today. Welcome. I'm Come so on excited in. to be here. Where's the craft room? Right this way. Let's go. <laughs> oh, wow. This is beautiful. Look at this craft room. My style really is very much inspired by nature. So I kind of think, you know, a little boho, a little whimsical. So it's my kind of multi-purpose space. I'm in here, you know, sometimes as an office space and doing some good old R&D and uh, then I'm in here meditating and then I think my gift is saying, okay, how can I make that accessible to the masses? How can I make this easy for people to do and make something that they're successful with and also proud of? By the way, I love the meditating. You take a deep breath in and you smell the glue gun. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that dang glue gun. I can't do without it. <laughs> so what are we making today? So today, on that note, we're going to be making a faux um, steer skull. Gun. So the glue gun has its own stand, of course, Jane. Oh, da -da -da -da. Glue gun. <laughs> so first we're going to start with the primed resin faux skull. You can get them online. Mm -hmm. So Etsy's a great source if you go oh. to Etsy. So, so somebody um, casts these. They actually cast them from a mold. And then we're gonna paint it. So we'll kind of use our sponge brushes and we'll paint a base layer on the actual skull and on the antlers. Did I get right here inside the nostrils? And get inside those nostrils. You got it. I'm gonna start working on the horns. Oh, good idea. I'm gonna paint them okay. like a dark brown. And then once this dries a tiny, tiny bit, we can go and take our stain and just lightly dry brush it. That just oh, gives it, isn't that nice? It yeah, gives it yeah. like a more natural look. It's literally stained. Because bone isn't pure white the yeah. whole time. It's not perfect. So if you want to just start uh, maybe right here and just add a little glue for me, I'm going to apply right the here. moss. Mm -hmm. We're going to get out our trusty little glue gun and we're going to start to attach. And I'll yes. just kind of keep going. Oh, yes. Teamwork Where here. Where do I put it? And then let's here kind of go have. down a little okay. bit with it. Ooh, getting hot. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Woo! So, the glue yeah, gun. I know. 
then so, you just fill in the rest. And then you can just rest. fill in the rest. I mean, you could add some rocks or some crystals or, you know, really anything that you want. This is awesome. Everyone is going to start making their own desert scapes. I hope right? they do. Yeah. Thanks so much to Brooke. Now we all know how to make a boho chic faux steer skull inspired by the desert landscape. And that is what Brooke is making in her craft room. What are you making in your craft room? I'll see you next time. <laughs> what a great idea. This is so cute. I love the centerpiece. Thank you. We are back with mixed media artist Jen Cushman, and you have a really cool DIY project to show us how to do. These bib necklaces are so trendy and so hot right now. Uh -huh. Easy to make. You okay. can make it with stuff out of your house. Love it. So first thing you need to do is you need to get a piece of a box, a top of a box, mm -hmm. and you want to make a template. So just make a half oh. moon shape. You can use a bowl or a basket or something and just trace it out. Or like a plate even. A so plate. then it's just right on the thing. Yep. You're going to trace that out, cut it out, and then you have that shape. Okay. Next thing you want to do is you want to find um, a substrate or something to put it on. I just use canvas. So really substrate for people like us is mm -hmm. just material. It's just material. It just <laughs> okay. means you need a base to put it on, okay. right? So it could be felt, it could be canvas, it could be leather, it could be metal. Oh cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're gonna then trace this on the fabric and then cut it out. And then cut it out. I'm gonna cut while you move on to the next step. So after you cut it out, the next thing you want to do is if you're using fabric, you mm -hmm. need to stiffen it up a little bit. You need to give it a bit of some structure. So you can put fabric stiffener on there. I just use white gesso which which is basically a white base. You can use glue and water, anything you need to do that just stiffens up the fabric a little bit. Oh wow, that's cool. Yep, okay. and then go ahead and punch the holes. So then the next thing to do is to get all of those fun bits and bobbles in your after in your studio, right? So Or in your junk drawer. In your junk drawer, <laughs> even better. So I just cut out a bunch of circles from an old pair of jeans, mm -hmm. and then I'm just gonna start hot glue gunning these babies down. I love that. I always say so, save your scraps, because you never know where you're gonna use them. Yeah. And and now your denim scraps are turning into a really cute bib necklace. Absolutely. It's so trendy. Absolutely. And a glue gun totally fine for necklace making? Absolutely. You okay. can go ahead and do this. I mean, if you are going to sell your work or do some other things, you might want to go ahead and stitch things on mm -hmm. or do it, but you know, again, hot glue is just fine. So now I'm going to go ahead and add some of these cute little crochet buttons on here or crochet flowers on here. So really, the bottom line is any embellishment that you want. Anything goes. Okay. You can do this and then you can use, there's some great metal buttons that would give it a different look or you can use these mother of pearl buttons. Um, I like to use recycled things, uh -huh. so I love to get the buttons where the, the thread is already in them, so oh. I tend to use my, I actually, when I'm digging through, I look for that. I look for buttons I with the thread that. in them. Because it, it kind of looks like it was just oh, ripped off someone's shirt. It was ripped off of someone's shirt. I love that. And so, so. you're going to continue with that and mm -hmm. then you tie the strings on? Yep, and then you have to make sure that you punch the holes in them because mm -hmm. you've got to get some attachments. And then you just take some leather cording, some I lace, some ribbon, some ripped jeans, whatever you want to do. You thread those through the holes and then you just go ahead and tie a knot and okay. you can tie it in the back. So I'm going to let you to finish. Mm -hmm. They're going to turn out just like this. Jen, thank you so much. What a great idea. Now you can make your own DIY bib necklace from items you have in the house. When we come back, we'll check out the trend of tiny homes. Could you live in one? And I'll give you some great party tips for your next get together. A town that's embracing the tiny home trend. So we're taking a field trip to Pine Top Lakeside to check it out. Hi, I'm Steve Dedman. I own Lux City here in Lakeside, Arizona. When I was a kid, uh, I played Monopoly for the very first time. So I always knew that I was going to be in real estate in some way. I was a very poor kid. And so my goal has always been, how do you live life without killing yourself? Since then, I've always wanted to do something to help people and give somebody that affordable living. And here we are in Luxony, first tiny home community in Arizona. We're in Lakeside, Arizona. We're in between Pine Top and Sholo, Arizona, up in the high country. We got some pines, beautiful country up here. Luxury tiny home living is kind of that slogan of, we can upgrade your tiny home to kind of whatever you want to. 
Well, the max we'll build is 400 square foot, and we can pretty much put any of your wants and dreams within that square footage, so therefore we're luxury. And the difference is we're trying to create a community that people are proud to come home to. We have families here. We have a, a husband, wife, and two kids living in our tiny home, so it's enough room, and the demographic is everywhere. It's a beautiful thing because everybody can benefit from this. I'm Sherry. I'm a resident of Lexington. I love it. I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> so it, the concept kind of confused people when I told them we were getting ready to move up here. My husband and I live here with uh, two dogs and a cat. We made it to our 39th wedding anniversary without killing each other, so that worked. I work now as an on-site salesperson for Lexington. I have a little office sign out on the front of the house and people will stop in. And the first words is, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much room you could have. They don't believe that it's only 399 square feet. And I'm like, we could get out the tape measure if you'd like to figure this out, but it really is 399 square feet. We have a full-size kitchen. We have our living area. The bedroom does fit a queen-size bed very comfortably. We have a full-size closet. We have a full-size washer and dryer behind a barn door in the bedroom. We have a huge corner shower. We've had the, the big house, we've had the vehicles, we've had the toys, but here I have everything I need. My goal is to help people live a sustainable life and not worry about, well, I gotta work so hard to pay my mortgage and I gotta work so hard to pay for this or this and this. You know, live your life and enjoy and relax. That's the idea. Everything I've done here, you see, is all part of me. This road in general right here is named after my sister, Stacy Erlene. Uh, I lost her to cancer and I wanted to give something back to her. And uh, a couple of my roads here are named after my kids. This is who I am. Who I am is Luxtony. up on burgers, getting their patios ready and gearing up for 4th of July parties. And with a little inspiration, you can make your parties even better with some DIY decorations. So for the table, it's a simple one and done table runner. Just lay three bandanas down the center of your table, overlapping the edges just a little bit. It's no sew, no glue, no nothing, and super DIY sensible. Now for the place settings, all you need to do is cut off the backside of old jeans and you're done, done in placemats. You can use the pockets for utensils and even a napkin. And once you wash them, they get that cool frayed look on the edges. Next, give your plastic utensils a patriotic look too. Simply cover the handles with decorative washi craft tape and even your food can be decorated. Just cut strips of red and white paper and cut out blue stars and glue them on top. Wrap them around your hot dogs and they are diy delicious. Now, Rocket Candy Bags are an explosive favor for the kids. Using white paper bags, add star stickers and stripes, fill them with candy, wrap the edges with tape, and then add the finishing touches, like a red cone to one end and glitter pipe cleaner to the other. Then let the kids rip them open for the big surprise. Now, koozies are always welcome on a hot day to keep your beverages cool. So, cover a piece of insulated liner material with patriotic fabric and glue or sew on some Velcro, or you can secure the edges together with safety pins. And finally, time for 4th of July fashion. Make your feet festive by tying strips of red, white, and blue ribbon to a plain pair of flip-flops, or create personalized flag t-shirts using your handprint and fabric paint. The kids will love making these. And there you have it, an inspired Star Spangled DIY 4th of July. Next on Creative Living, you'll have a blast making these party favors. For more great videos highlighting all that's happening across Arizona, visit yourview.com.
fireworks will explode in the sky this 4th of July, so why not ignite the party with these DIY rocket candy bags? You'll need white paper bags, red, white, and blue washi tape, red cardstock cut into a circle, silver metallic pipe cleaners, star stickers, your paper scissors, and candy. First, cut off the bottom of the bag and down the side so you have about a 9 by 9 inch square. Next, tape the long ends together to create the body of the rocket so there are openings at both ends. Using alternating colors, add the washi tape all the way around the bag until you've covered the entire bag. Next, add the star stickers all over. Tightly twist one end of the bag, then wrap tape around the twisted end to secure. You can fill the bag with candy or other treats, then tightly twist the opening end and wrap tape around it to secure. To create the rocket topper, cut halfway into the red paper circle until the point of your scissors reaches the center. Using the center as a point, overlap the edges of the circle to make a cone. Squeeze a dab of glue inside the point of the cone and place it over one end of the twisted ends of the bag. Add silver pipe cleaners to the other twisted end of the bag, and you're done! There you have it. You can make several of these to put into a large bowl on display, or they make a great bring-along treat if you're going to a party as a guest. And you could sit back and listen to all your friends ooh and ah as they make these rocket candy bags explode. We want to thank our guest, Jen Cushman, for her great advice on how to turn your DIY passion into a business. But before we let you go, we've got a few more tips on how to start that business. Start off trying your hobby as a business part-time and ease into it. That way you can see if you really like it and can make money. You don't have to sell products to turn your hobby into profits. Consider teaching. If you like to take photos of food, think of ways you can create a business teaching people how to take photos. Don't give up. It takes time and dedication to turn that hobby into something more. Seek out advice from experts like the Small Business Administration and keep going. You can do it. Thanks so much for joining us right here on Creative Living. I'm Jane Monzuris, and I'll see you next time.